So uh, welcome to today's Wednesday seminar. For those of you particularly online who don't know me, I'm James Johnson. I'm the CEO here at Geoscience Australia. And I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of lands throughout Australia and here in Canberra, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and acknowledge uh, First Nations people's continuing connection to land, waters, sky and community and pay our respects from Geoscience Australia to the cultures and elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge that this week is National Reconciliation Week and here at Geoscience Australia we're striving, we're a bit on a bit of a journey striving to make that real and um, if I think about where we were at say 10 years ago we did virtually nothing. We would strive to uh, stay on the right side of legality when we were going on country um, and understanding only as much as we absolutely needed to to not be uh, breaking rules or laws. We realised uh, along the way that um, that's not good enough and so we started getting better prepared and, and created a group that was all about land access and we actually called it land access and, and, uh, and in lacked the engagement piece. And then I realised, or we collectively realised, that that's only about uh, approaching someone when you want something. That's not engagement. So we're at a point now where we're actually starting to do genuine engagement and genuine knowledge, knowledge exchange. And we've got a fantastic opportunity to accelerate that and continue down that path with uh, the recently announced Resourcing Australia's Prosperity Program, where we have certainty into the future, we can plan longer term, and we can actually start to resource the things that probably we should have been doing all along, exchanging knowledge both ways, and ideally creating opportunities for economic empowerment for First Nations peoples across Australia. Today we'll be hearing from Jim Hill, uh, Yirrindali traditional custodian and Carlin Burns from the Lake Eyre Basin Ranges, co he's the coordinator of that group. Over the past 18 months, uh, the Exploring for the Future Geoscience Knowledge Sharing Project has been working with the Lake Eyre Basin Ranges program. The Ranges program provides services to traditional custodians and natural resource managers across the majority of Western Queensland. The Geoscience Knowledge Sharing Project is working with the Ranger Program to build capability in geoscience knowledge. And we're really lucky to have Jim and Carlin speaking with us today. So please join me in welcome, welcoming them to the podium. G'day everyone. Um, yeah, I'd just like to begin by uh, today by acknowledging the uh, traditional custodians of this land, uh, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. And um, yeah, basically just want to pay our respects to the elders, past and present. Um, I'm Carlin Burns, this is Jim Hill, but yeah, um, I am, um, I have, I'm culturally diverse actually. Uh, I come from up Queensland and uh, I come from uh, up Queensland and uh, I'm culturally diverse in six different groups. Uh, the six di different groups are Gunganji, uh, Gungalita, uh, and Gugujungan, but also Takalaka, um, uh, Wogame, and Gidame. Jim? Good morning, everyone. My name is Jim Hill. I'm a direct descendant of the Urundali traditional owners. Um, but I'm also a bit like Carlin. I, my ties are uh, with um, Yurundali, now and Mumbara people. On my mum's side is Waliwara and Aoyawara people, which extends into the Northern Territory. Um, and, it's, and, and it's been a privilege to come down because I've been waiting for a long time to come and meet with Geoscience. Um, so hopefully today we can tell our story and give you a, a much better understanding of where we're coming from as traditional owners. Yeah, I, I just really want to start off also by saying, um, you know, thanks to Geoscience for the invitation to come down and, uh, yeah, basically work uh, and you know, have this uh, ongoing partnership with, with you guys. So, as you can see, uh, that's the Lake Air Basin. Kathy Thunder. 
Um, so the Lake Eyre Basin is one of the world's largest internally draining river systems. Its streams do not reach the sea. It spans 1.2 million square kilometres, uh, which is almost one-sixth of Australia. The basin includes large parts of South Australia, the Northern Territory and Queensland and Western New South Wales. Um, the Lake Eyre Basin system also straddles four jurisdictions um, and it is of both global ecological importance and regional First Nations cultural significance. It is a rare example of a remaining intact set of dryland rivers, floodplains, uh, connected alluvial hydrology left on the planet. Lake Eyre, Basin, Lake Eyre Basin is a unique and special basin and I think you can all agree it's worth protecting. So if you have a look on the, uh, as a ranger, the, the challenges with maintaining uh, the health and productivity of such a complex set of river, uh, set of river and floodplain systems are substantial. So the challenges include the need to maintain both the integrity of the surface water processes on the various water courses as well as subsurface hydrology. What happens in the upper streams and rivers, the subsurface hydrology and ecological functionality and the current and potential engineering activities on and below the surface are all relevant and, inter and interconnected. Lake Eyre Basin ranges are funded under the Indig Indigenous Land Sea Ranger Program, um, which is you know Department of Environment, Science and Innovation. And our 10 Lake Eyre Basin ranges cover up to 30% of Queensland. So if you have a look at that map on the Queensland side, you'll see that we cover 510,000 square kilometres with 10 ranges. So in doing so, uh, the Lake Eyre Basin ranges obtain guidance and management direction from the GDC Ag, which is the Georgina Diamant Diamantina Cooper Catchment Aboriginal Group and consists up to 18 traditional owner groups that provide priorities to the rangers and assist in formulating a priority work plan to address their cultural concerns. Now if you have a look at the, the, the green uh, within, you know, within the Queensland side, that's all national park. So we work in with national parks uh, and managing, their, you know, managing um, that side as well. The good thing about our Lake Air Basin Range is that we're tenure blind. We basically can work off National Park on private, you know, private land, landholders' um, you know, areas, but also uh, working with local, state, and federal governments, and um, also uh, NRM groups. So yeah, that's a lot to cover in that area, um, and uh, everything's interconnected. So the traditional owners of the Lake Eyre Basin have obligations to look after their country, rivers and water places according to the ancestral law and law, LAW, and custom. This, this is demonstrated by the ongoing connections between traditional custodians and country and by the beliefs, trad traditions and oral histories associated with this unique landscape. For the traditional owners, rivers are an intricate part of the landscape, holding vast social, cultural and economic importance. The value of rivers is intangible. Rivers have significance in the number of ways, for example, numerous story places and totem species are social with water, making it central to the relationship between people and country. Okay, just for the next, we're going to go in and out with the slides, um, but I think that to deal, to understand when we talk about Indigenous perspective regarding water, um, stuff that I sort of done years ago, um, and the approach is to determine the best approach to address values and expectation regarding water and natural resource management is the examination of both non-Indigenous and Indigenous values is required to exercise integrity and two-way learning of environmental relationship and the importance of water. Uh, for this uh, seminar here is about the recognition of Indigenous values. I've used the Third World Water Forum Kyoto, Kyoto Japan, March 2003, which is useful and in providing the guiding principle for a collaborative approach. Uh, Third World Water Forum, uh, Kyoto, it talks about relationship to water, um, and this is about Indigenous people all in internationally. So their statement is that we, the Indigenous people from all parts of the world, assemble here, reaffirm our relationship to Mother Earth and responsibility to future generation to raise our voices in solidarity to speak for the protection of water. We are placed in a sacred manner on this earth, each in our own sacred and traditional lands and territories to care for all of creation and to care for water. 
Um, in the sacred status, we recognize, honor, and respect water as a sacred and, and sustains all life. Our traditional knowledge, laws, and ways of life teach us to be responsible in caring for the sacred gift that connects all life. And as it explains a little bit more, our relationship with our lands, territories, and water is a fundamental physical, cultural, and spiritual basis for our existence. The relationship to our Mother Earth requires us to conserve our fresh waters and oceans for the survival of present and future generations. We assert our role as caretakers with rights and responsibilities to defend and ensure the protection, availability and purity of water. We stand united to follow and implement our knowledge and traditional laws and exercise our right of self-determination to preserve water and to preserve life. In addition, um, Articles 25 and 26 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People contains direct reference to own, develop, control and use water as being a human right. Um, and, and since 2019, Queensland Human Rights Act has, um, has come into play and it, it talks about Section 28, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in Queensland hold distinct cultural rights. They include the right to practice their beliefs and teachings, use their languages, protect and develop their kinship ties, and maintain the relationship with the lands, seas, and waterways. So I think the timing of, of, of this seminar is falling in line with what's changing in statutory law, uh, both at, at a Commonwealth and also at an international level. Within the broader context of human rights, the right to water is emerging as a crucial element that intersects with other rights, such as the right to life, the right to an adequate standard of living, and a substantive aspect of this right is founded in there being adequate quantity and quality of water. In regards to procedural rights, it may include a right to information, um, and part of that is, is why we're here with Geoscience too, because it holds a lot of data, um, and for us to collectively make the right decisions, we need to have agreements with um, each, with GSIs or any other people that hold data to, to help us make informed <coughs> choices around water management. So it's, it's about having a right to participate in decision making and a right to recourse for environmental harm suffered. When we talk about Indigenous water law, um, Indigenous people's knowledge and customary acts of water law linked spiritually to social, environment, economic, culture and property rights. Indigenous people's knowledge and customary acts of water law in practical application deals with the properties, the distribution and circulation of water on and below the earth's surface in the, and in the atmosphere. Now to get a little bit more understanding of how we feel um, is, is, when we talk about Indigenous sense of belonging, water is set, held sacred and is honoured as a life force that, that is an inherent property embodying our spiritual, social and emotional sense of belonging. This sense of belonging is culturally ingrained in our identity and way of life enhancing our compassion through thought, feeling, sight, smell, taste, touch and sound. So when we're on country, uh, you know, to be in pristine country, it's, it's when we go home to country, it, 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 it provides us with a uh, a sense of healing and, and uh, like we, we all deal with what we deal with all day every day but when we go back on country all that slowly disappears so we re-energize and then come back to deal with what we've got to deal with. So these sensations are part of our makeup and biological relationship attaining a sense of being one and the same. So when we talk about water it has a spiritual energy and, and um, so if there's impact to water because we're, it's culturally ingrained within, it, within ourselves so if there's impact, then we feel that fear and that threat as well. Um, and it's because of this sense of belonging that any adversity or stress to any creatures, land and sea country is felt by Indigenous people cause a social and emotional unwellness. Um, indigenous knowledge and customary law is applied to the ongoing exercise of practice within the three dimensions of ecosystems and water usage. So we look at thresholds, in order to maintain a natural balance for the life on land and sea country, 
uh, the rate of use that indicate the consumption and or sustaining life and productivity, productivity of land and sea country. Temporal distribution of use is the pattern to water usage or requirement, the timing, the frequency, duration, wet and dry season are all cultural indicators aligned to customs of environmental water management. And following on with the traditional water resource management, the following patterns demonstrate the fundamental basis of water resource management and customary law principles both on country and off country that reflect water title and possession. So these are the key things we talk about as traditional ecological knowledge, the carrying capacity of land, seasonal climate change management reflected in natural law, uh, reciprocal relations, uh, secular history, natural science and cultural beliefs are uh, part of a management system for us. So ownership and permanent inheritance on country, fair trade, and, and, and in the modern day now, making sure that we have shared benefit agreements occurring with traditional owners. Recognition and substantive equality prescribing sufficient regard to freedom of cultural expression, meaning and purpose in, in the areas of Indigenous people's distinct status and culture, Indigenous tenure systems, natural capital and resource management, religion, language, heritage and history, science and traditional ecological knowledge, politi political, social and economic right, title and possession, permanent inheritance and equity investments. So these are some of the key areas that you know, we will focus on and, and when we do business with proponents or government or, or whoever you have to deal with to provide a, a much greater understanding of, of what we need to engage in and on. Um, this story, or well, the narrative is basically, the framework is a re reference from the Ramsar Convention that adopted a broad wetland definition. So we look at the five systems, marine, coastal wetlands, including rocky shores, riverine, wetlands along rivers and streams, estuarine, deltas, tidal marsh, mangrove swamps, lacustrine, wetlands associated with lakes, palestrine, marshes, swamps and bogs. But within that process, if we look at key cultural values, uh, the functions or the interactions that ha occurs within the water system, plant spe species diversity, animal species diversity, um, and what we look at um, from my personal view is direct use value, indirect use value, precautionary values, bequest values, and existence values. And that most of you, like within, you know, as scientists, you will understand, um, and we talk about functions, attributes, and interactions. So water, uh, all the attributes, water, biodiversity, soil, flood mitigation through water storage, foreshore protection from wave action and erosion, and groundwater recharge, uh, which comes on the other reflection is on um, improved water quality, to protect nursery and breeding grounds, um, to manage nutrient cycling, soil and water con conservation, water storage, and energy. Um, so over the, over the years, it's sort of like working for government and um, understanding their science. Like I'm not a scientist, but I just understand what needs to be done and what education is important to me as a traditional owner. So when we talk about direct use, uh, indigenous people's value and patterns of environmental protection and biodiversity conservation are applied to customary practice reflecting uh, recognition, the usage, enjoyment of fundamental freedom in a political, economic, social, environmental and cultural field. Uh, sustainable practice to supply or being supplied with the necessaries of life, seasonal and continuous change management in natural law, large and small economy based on individual and collective ownership, uh, financial capital, dollar values and equitable returns, social and emotional well-being. Uh, so when we talk about direct, these are the direct things that impact o o on us when it comes to development or any impact on, on water. Indirect use, indigenous people's values are culturally connected through a web of life and customary law that is applied to affect the ongoing exercise of seasonal and change management reflected in natural law, which has the purpose to exercise acts of authority, responsibility and compliance management, which has the purpose or effect of 
sustainable growth of Indigenous societies through protection of health, stability, production and fertility of land and sea country, um, authority to regulate renewable and non-renewable resource, attain special and spiritual well-being of people, land and sea country. So when we talk about the tangibles and intangibles, this is um, sort of understanding we want to provide you know, to the broader Australian community when we deal on country. But we also have principles around precautionary value, um, is, which is inherent to seasonal and change management reflected in natural law. So indigenous acts of law and custom is practiced with due, jurisprudence of title and possession, privilege and responsibility, tenure systems, renewable, non-renewable resource patterns, environmental protection, biodiversity conservation, ecological sustainable economy, uh, quality and sustainability, and fair trade. Um, and, and, and this, in a Western way, the word is, is a modern day language, but in a traditional setting uh, where tribal councils and authorities influence pathways and responsive course of action based on procedural knowledge and, and best practice for the decision making and judgment that is embodied with their natural science, history, and cultural beliefs. Uh, these principles are regarded as moral and legal cornerstones of property rights to approve the ongoing exercise and implementation built on the foundation of reciprocal obligation and avoidance custom to fulfil a continuous way of life and well-being of people, land and sea country. So even though we, we have been, uh, you know, cultures has been disrupted throughout colonisation, but still Trisalana knowledge has been maintained and preserved in little pockets to, and a lot of it sort of still built around precautionary value because we, we look at life on country as a privilege, uh, but we also are true custodians who manage that <coughs> land, not just for today, but for the next generation and the next generation to come. So, which leads into bequest values. Indigenous identity and way of life is practiced in accordance with traditional customary law and applied with the fundamental basics of belief, authority, responsibility, property rights, and permanent inheritance. This group of tangible and intangible property is upheld and honoured for the survival of current and future generations, which are reflected in harmonious relationships embedded within cultural norms, honouring seasonal and change management reflected in natural law of land and sea country. Cultural learning are nurtured and exercised in everyday activities such as language, education, stories, song, art, craft, dance, mythology, cosmology, sacred matters and religion. These values are important assets and foundation of political, social, cultural, environment, economic and emotional well-being, providing continuous comfort, strength and wisdom that recognise the sacredness of life. So having sharing the understanding of that bequest values is why we now sort of you know, come to meet with people like Geoscience who collect a lot of data on geology, water, stuff like that, because, it, because our systems have been disrupted you know, since colonisation. It, it's about taking the new science now and how do we marry it up because um, using that data then to... Um, like I do a lot of agreement making with um, proponents and mining companies, so it's about having that data to basically, because every agreement there is written around prior, free prior informed consent. And I can't sign off on, unless I have the data to back me up from a, from a scientific world, but also from the cultural environment. So it's critical now, you know, strengthening the relationship, especially with geoscience, <coughs> with mapping, um, water, uh, you know, collecting data on water, geology, all that sort of stuff. So it, it, yeah, so to me, the timing has been right, you know, to come and meet with you guys down there. The existing value, the principle is an inherent relatedness and connectedness of identity, value, beliefs, authority and responsibility to uphold all integrity of land and sea country, remaining in existence through continuation and persistence, judiciary obligation to current and future generations, security of political, social, environment, cultural and economic rights, and interventions honouring substantive equality to Indigenous well-being that is derivative of traditional customary law 
and spiritual values were reflected in the Third World Water Forum he uttered March 2003. So if, if you have time, I, I recommend you, you know, have a bit of a read around the Kyoto Protocol because that's um, it's, it's collaboration of, of Indigenous people from all around the world that came to stand up for their rights um, with their, in regard to protection of water rights. Um, and when we talk about um, a long-term system, um, basically of traditional owners and, and cultures and belief, but if you look at the cultural factual patterns, um, we still maintain title and possession, law, both LAW, LORE, rules and regulation. Uh, we talk key things around biological resource, values and attributes, seasonal indicators, which are life cycles and climatic condition, traditional resource usage, who, what, when, why, how, uh, gender specific, a lot of traditional law and custom is gender specific, male, male and female, initiated, uninitiated. Um, and, and young people and, and elders. So decision species, uh, which are also social and environmental indicators. So when customary law and stuff is being held, there are certain tree plants that you know, they use as indicators for the commencement of those ceremonies and closure. But at the same token, uh, species are also indicators when, when country is not well. Um, and within this process, we have social regime, we have kinship, we have customs, we have practice and tradition that, that is used to manage country and also manage people within their own structures. Economic is about fair trade and shared benefit agreement. For a long time, um, we were dispossessed, property rights taken away, but now um, legal instruments now are changing and, and the voice of the people in the world are changing too. So. It's about, you know, having, if there's going to be commercialisation of any biodiversity, water, soil, then it's about sitting down and creating shared benefit agreements. Because at the moment, traditional owners in Australia uh, really don't have any financial capital or anything. So it's sort of finding the leverage to be able to strike good, fair deals that allow for traditional owners um, to be able to um, improve the life you know, from where they're sitting out now to be competitive and, and pretty much the same with, with all Australians. Precautionary principles, um, we, still, we still have safety nets um, and conservation economy and that's about recognising all the statutory laws that are in place now, how do we understand them, how do we articulate them to make sure that they provide the protection um, of biodiversity in their waters so that you know, our cultural rights are not being lost or, or, or given away. Uh, spiritual, spiritual, we talk about religion, ceremony, rituals and beliefs, etc. Um, and on my mum's country, um, like a lot of people I've talked to, they think that law and ceremony is just in textbooks, but on my mum's country and with Thomas's on that side, yeah, in Western Territory, uh, law is still alive, it's still practice, initiation is still well, so it's not it's not something that's disappeared, and we just don't read about it in a textbook. Bioregional diversity and, and in integrity. Um, part of us being down there too is not just about the geology and the water; it's about conservation and the cultural landscape that we live in, and how do we work together uh, in collaboration to maximise um, biodiversity and protect and conserve it as much as possible. Um, heritage is about succession of property right. Um, what I mean there is talking about um, continuation of um, practice to maintain cultural heritage, uh, but also how we work in with uh, proponents or, or any or government services and how do we collaborate. Because in the probably last 10 years, I've worked with all sorts of government uh, service providers and um, a lot of them are scientists. Uh, they, they are professionals at what they do, but the connection with cultural understanding and the story, it, 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 it's, it's a big gap. And so hopefully while we're here, we can provide a little bit more understanding and sharing how we can collaborate and make that work. Um, because it's, a, you know, Australia is a multicultural society. So we're, you know, at, I think that, you know, we have a lot to share and, uh, and, to, and for people to understand but at the same token, we're also learning 
from uh, other groups as well understanding because either way we're all going to live in this one place you know, in Australia so I think that this collaboration has to work smarter and more effective in how we manage looking after the country and also our waters. I think that's just about yeah, so, so if there's any questions and things you want to ask about anything that's been we discussed today, I'm pretty, between Carl, we're pretty happy to have a yarn with everyone. Um, but I think, you know, like, at the end of the day, like, I, I, I think with Carl and, and um, his liaison with GeoScience, I, I, I'd just like to thank you for inviting me down here to talk about my perspective, you know, from a cultural point of view. Mm. Right.